Um, before I go any further, the one thing I did forget to announce, and I only had it sitting right beside me, uh, you know, so out of sight, out of mind. It was only right beside me, Kathy, so, you know. Uh, for Advent, we're going to start in, in the adult Sunday school. Uh, we will start a new study. It's called The Names of the, for the Messiah, and it's by Walter Brueggemann. And Walter Brueggemann is really one of the top, if not the top, Old Testament scholar in the world. Um, and so this is a great little book. It's very, it's great large print bill, so there's not a lot of words in here. And I don't think too many of them are big. <laughs> I always teach Bill about only big words when he's up here reading. Uh, so it's a great little study. It's a kind of a workbook. It has questions in it too. Uh, so if anybody wants to take part of this for, for Advent in the adult Sunday school, let me know. I've got some copies of it. And if I get a lot of people that want to take the study, we can always order more. I'm sure that, that, that Judy will let me, right, Judy? Uh, I've got budget for it. So. <laughs> so if anybody wants to take that study for Advent, we'll start that the first Sunday of Advent, so which is the first Sunday of December. So with that, um, today we're talking about, uh, we're looking at Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. And we're talking about the temple, the destruction of the temple is foretold there. Now the temple... Um, that was the, what G, that Jesus is talking about here would be the second temple. This is Herod's temple. Um, the first temple was Solomon's temple, and that was destroyed by the Babylonians. Herod's temple was, was built by Herod the Great, and it was still under construction at the time of Jesus. Jesus, it, it wasn't completed until about 63 AD, which would have been about 30 years after Jesus' death, roughly. Um, and then it was destroyed in 70. Um, the temple, uh, all that remains of it is the Wailing Wall, and I'm hoping that when Gail and I go to Israel, that I, I'm certain that we get to see the, with the Wailing Wall. I can't imagine that they would take us on a tour and not take us to see the Wailing Wall. Hopefully we'll get to go up on Temple Mount. That kind of depends upon the, the, the political situation at the time, whether you're allowed up there or not, is my understanding. I pray that we're able to get up there and see that. Um, but the temple was a large construction. Um, what I've read is that, that, that you could have put 20 football fields within the temple. Um, that, that, it was a, that it was covered in white marble and gold. Now, I can remember a number of years ago, um, they recovered the, the, the Nebraska State Capitol. They went up on the, the, the dome of it and they recovered it in gold leaf. And of course, it was an absorbent amount of money. And I remember thinking, what a incredible waste of money to put gold leaf on the, the dome. The temple wasn't gold leaf. It was slabs of gold that they had on it. It's not just a paper thin. And I have some 24 karat gold leaf. I've used it for some of my painting when I was painting. I still have some. It's very thin stuff. What they were putting up there was slabs of gold. Heavy pieces of gold that were attached to the side of the temple. And as you saw, came to the temple from a distance, if the sun was just right, it would gleam in the, in the sunlight so much that you had to avert your eyes. You couldn't look directly at it because it was so bright from the white marble and the gold reflecting the sun. So it was an incredible sight. Within the temple, you had all of these things that all of the, all of the nations of the world had, that, that, that were known at the time had donated and given things to the temple. People would try to, again, buy their way into paradise, basically. It was almost like a, a, a pre-indulgence is what the Catholic Church had done. And you would buy things for the temple. So you had gold tables, basically, hanging through the, through the temple that were huge, not just little spindly chains, but huge things with leaves on these, these, these things, the gold leaves fashioned from gold. It would be as large as a man, some would some say. So it was an extraordinary thing to behold, an incredible thing. All of the grandeur of God was the idea. And this is where the Jewish people believed that you could find, and the only place you could find God was in the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, which the Orthodox Jews to this day will not go up on Temple Mount for fear that they might step where the Holy of Holies was located, because nobody's exactly 100% sure exactly where the Holy of Holies was. And if you're an Orthodox Jew and you were to step into the Holy of Holies, you might believe that you would be struck down 
uh, we're, we're desecrating the holiest spot in the world, the place that God himself resides. So, we have that. There are also people that believe that Jesus will not come again until the temple is rebuilt. Most of my life I have heard stories about how that in Israel there are warehouses filled with, with building materials ready to rush out to rebuild the temple as quickly as they can uh, if the opportunity arises to rebuild the temple, which is not likely to happen since the Temple on the Rock is there, the, the Islamic uh, mosque sits up there on the holy on the on Temple Mount. Uh, so it's not likely that, 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 that anytime soon that that will be rebuilt. But there is a faction of Judaism, and if you Google it, there you will find if there are groups or a group that is trying to rebuild the temple. They are working towards that means, and, and it's been going on for a long time. So there is that belief that the temple has to be rebuilt for God to come back and into, into, the, into the world. So here we have Jesus talking about the temple, and talking about signs, and talking about the end. So if you'll go to Luke 21, uh, chapter, or chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, As for these things that you see, the day will, days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When, they, when you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and, in, and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to justify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your souls. Now here Jesus is talking to the disciples. That's already happened. Um, we skipped at this lectionary time. We, we, we didn't talk about the, uh, the great uh, the entrance into uh, to Jerusalem, but that's already happened. And this, this thing is trying to plague me more, Scott, trying to jump off my belt. Um, Jesus has already entered Jerusalem. This is the beginning of the end. We find ourselves in a peculiar time here with this, this route of the, the lectionary in that we are talking about the end of Jesus' life as we're getting ready to very soon jump into Advent and the coming and the birth of Jesus. But this is where we're at it as we come to this end of the church lectionary year. Um, again, the temple uh, is a beautiful place. And the disciples are there, their small bathroom, small backwater area, and they're just looking at the grandeur of this and going, wow, this is amazing. Now remember, it's going to get even more amazing because it's many years yet that it's going to be worked upon. So even what they're looking at as being so magnificent wasn't the final magnificence of the temple. Um, and we, it's hard for us to imagine the destruction that the Romans did to it without any kind of power tools or, or equipment, but they literally tore down these stones that were the size of rail cars, box cars, and bigger. How in the world did they do this? It boggles the mind. It boggles the mind to think how much destructive energy and focus that took. But when they took Jerusalem, the Romans, during the, the revolution, the, 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 the Jews had, had revolted and driven the, the Romans out. When they came back and conquered Jerusalem, it said that they killed oh, well over a million people in the, in the siege of Jerusalem. And nearly 100,000 were taken off as slaves. And 
then they raised the town. They, they leveled the temple. So we have a hard time thinking about that much destructive vengeance. But this is how the Romans maintained control. You don't mess with us because we're going to come in and level you. And this is what happens. And so this is the destruction that these people are looking at. Now, as Luke writes these words, the temple has already been destroyed. The, Luke probably wrote this somewhere around 85, 80 to 85 AD. So the temple's been gone for 10, 15 years. Um, so they're looking back. And remember, Luke is writing to mostly a, a Gentile audience, and not so much a Jewish audience. It's a little more Gentile is what's generally believed. Perhaps he's even he's writing to people not just in that locale he's at, though. He's writing with the intent that this is going to be a distributed letter. And so you have people under persecution by the Romans. Now by 80, 85 AD, the Romans are, are hell-bent, pardon the phrase, on attacking the Christian movement. And you've got Paul, you know, Paul has been martyred already, Peter has been martyred. All of the disciples, say one is believed, were killed in a violent act. And yet we come down here and say, not a hair of your head will perish. But yet we know that all the disciples by this time, the people that Jesus is talking to here, save one, they've all been killed violently. They've all been martyred in the name of Christ. And so what Jesus is getting at here, or what we walk away from it here, I guess, with, um, we, Luke is writing to these people, you're going through some terrible times. And we're going to have to have go through some terrible times. Now, many times we're taught we talk about that 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 the, that the second coming we're going to get some. For some of us, there's going to be an easy out, as they say. I'm not really an advocate of an easy out idea. I see scripture telling us that this being Christians is difficult business. As we said in Sunday school this morning, you know, who would sign up for this? Uh, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be betrayed. We're going to have people turn on us. Now, here in the United States, and we've said it many times, we don't necessarily understand all of this. We think we're persecuted because somebody won't say Merry Christmas to us at a store. And granted, that may be offensive to us, but that's certainly not having somebody want to kill us, is it? That's not somebody taking us before a judge and saying, this person is a Christian. They need to be dealt with. This is what they're dealing with here in the time that Luke's writing this, this book, this gospel. They have been being killed for, for following Christ. They have been being tortured for following Christ. And they will be for a considerable period of time yet. They're going to deal with that. And we've talked also again about where is the church doing the best right now? The church is actually growing the fastest, which I find it so phenomenally, supposedly in Iraq and Syria. That boggles our minds. These are places where we would scarcely want to be a Christian, would we here? I'm not sure I'd want to go to Iraq and be professing the gospel. Because you're literally putting your life on the line. Obedience, as we talked about in Sunday school today, costs you. There's a price to be paid for being a Christian. And if the price that we pay is being mocked or made fun of or ridiculed or having our, our some of our family think that we're nuts because you know they're an atheist and they think that the whole idea of God is ridiculous and you have to be a moron or a fool to follow Jesus. If that's the price we pay, that's a pretty small price to pay, folks. But yet we back away from professing the word because we're afraid of being put upon by being embarrassed or put down or mocked online. People, you know, we, we, we don't want to say we're a Christian. We don't want to stand up for what we believe because we don't, somebody might make fun of us. Somebody might kill those people in Iraq, but yet they're still the fastest growing place for Christianity in the world. Seems to me, and it's this, I'm hardly the first person to point this out, but the church does the best when it's persecuted the most. Which is the greatest irony of all. 
And we can look at these verses here and we can try to, to say, oh, Jesus is coming again. And, you know, why? So some, some might, might be, why bother? We, you know, we believe in Jesus, so we're good. And those other guys that hate me, why would I want to go over and try to spread the gospel to them? We can, we can become a Jonah of, of, of types, can't we? Um, but here, our, we, we, we can oftentimes have people, and, and we have the danger of preaching anything that has to do with the second coming, anything that has to do with the destruction of the temple, anything that has to do with the signs of the end times, as we can be pigeonholed as being an end times preacher. And uh, uh, hopefully by now you figured out that I don't like that role. And it can be a very destructive force for the church when you have someone saying, on this day Jesus is coming again. And then the day comes and goes and we all look like fools because that person said that. This church it, itself has dealt with that in the past and I am reminded of that and, and from time to time. People say, well, we, you know, and, and you can't do that. And so, in some ways, I should be hesitant to preach the end times. But what I'm going to tell you about the end times is nobody knows the time of the day. Anybody tells you the time of the day, they don't know what they're talking about. It's coming, but nobody knows when. And if we're, going to, if we're going to make our sole focus on that, then we're missing what Jesus wants us to do. And Jesus wants us to be in that time of trial, in that time of being persecuted, we're supposed to do what did he say here? Um, uh, this will give you an opportunity to testify. We should be, rather than feeling embarrassed, we should go, ah, I've had a chance to testify. I have a chance to witness. I have a chance to, to plant a seed or to water a seed. Or if, if in the face of all of this defiance, I can still say, well, you know, I believe in God and I believe that Jesus loves you too. And maybe that's all we need to say. We can feel befuddled for words because of our own ego. We don't want to be befuddled. I don't like it. I'm befuddled all the time, folks. But uh, Nancy, don't, you weren't supposed to laugh there. Uh, but we shouldn't be embarrassed because words fail us. Because the idea isn't you know, the, that we speak the perfect word at the perfect time. It's that Jesus is going to give us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will allow us through our lifetime through our witness to speak to each and everyone's heart. And we don't show, sell God short. God can do it. God can do it with the most meager tools of all. And if that we feel ourselves to be a meager tool, don't worry. God can use you to great effect. Just let him do so. Don't focus on thinking about when is Jesus coming again. Jesus is going to come again. It's going to happen. I don't know when, and if I told you that I did, I trust, I, I'd ask you not to believe me because I've lost my sanity for a temporary moment. Uh, it'll come back, right, Gary? It always does. Yeah, but um, the idea is, is that I live my life like tomorrow is the end. Now, I know that, that as Gail and I prepare to go to Israel and all of the bombing and the shelling that's going on, and we can get quite filled with anxiety about that and go, oh my gosh, this is a you know a turmoil time. That place has always been filled with turmoil. Because it's a place that people look to as a, as, as a place for God. And therefore people look to it as a symbol and they want to attack it, they want to deal with it, they want to control it. But the, the joke is on them. God was in the temple, but God was not the temple. We love this building. We come to this building because we, many of us have memories. You know, some, some of the, the folks here have never been to, a, you know, been a member of another church. They, from the time they were little, they've been inside this sanctuary. And so to them, this place is sacred. And it is sacred. We can come here and we can find God. But this is not God. This building someday will cease to be. If you follow my blog at all, you'll see that I post pictures of churches all the time. And many of those churches are falling apart. They're falling down. In fact, I saw a picture of a church that someone posted online yes, just yesterday um, with this beautiful cemetery. And there's the church. And the church is <coughs> falling down. It's just the roof line. The, the walls have collapsed. The roof is still standing slightly. 
and some of the stained glass windows, believe it or not, were still in the, in the, in the peak of the building, just sitting there in ruins. But that's not God, is it? It's a place we come, it's a place that helps us to focus, it's a, help, a place that helps us to, to bring our attention to God. But when we leave this place, God's with us. We don't go anywhere. We don't do anything. Whereas William pointed out, it's a little creepy that God is right there with us no matter where we go. But it shouldn't be creepy, it should be reassuring. That no matter what, no matter where, no matter how difficult the times are, no matter how much somebody's making fun of you for being a believer, it doesn't matter. Don't make fun. You've got God on your shoulder. He'll get you through. Praise God for the fact that He won't leave us alone. That He will, that He has blessed us, and that He will continue to bless us as long as we look to Him and we hold on to Him and we live for Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the message of Luke, the, the blessing that we have received through his gospel. Um, some of these things are a little scary, Lord, and we, sometimes we, 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 we as humans, we, we worry and we question and we doubt and we think we're smarter than others sometimes. And, and Lord, forgive us when we think we're so smart. Uh, Lord, but let us rather be like children and come to you with faith and come to you with, with the belief that you love us and that you will guide us and that you will cherish us and carry us through. And that no matter what happens to us in this world, Lord, when we talk about not a hair on your head will be harmed, we're talking about a spiritual hair, a spirit, Lord. Where we understand that you're talking about the life that is to come. And, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace. We thank you for the blessing. And we thank you for that salvation. We pray this in your name.